Today's lecture, we're going to talk about the juxtaclamellar complex. More specifically, we're going to discuss how this complex helps to regulate our blood pressure utilizing hormones such as ADH as well as aldosterone. So the first thing that we need to talk about here is within the juxtamedullary nephron, there are a couple different concepts we need to understand. So one is we have something which is known as the counter current multiplier. So the counter current multiplier, this is where the loop of Henle is, or the nephron loop is. So this here is what's representing the juxtamedullary uh, juxta nephron. That's what this represents. And this here is the loop of Henle. So coming here from, uh, from the glomerular capsule, you have what comes down here. This is the proximal convoluted tubule, and then this is the descending limb. So you have the descending limb, the ascending limb, and then this is the distal convoluted tubule. So this part over here, this is the countercurrent multiplier. And so the reason that we call it that is because as the fluid that's traveling down here, as it goes down, water, water is what's leaving. So water leaves through something which is known as these aquaporins. So as water leaves, you then come all the way up through the ascending limb. And within the ascending limb, this is where we pump out of our we pump out the salts, so the sodium and then the, the chloride. So this is the stuff that's um, pumped out. And we're pumping this out in order to create this really, this salty medulla. So what this does is it creates a salty medulla. And so <clears throat> the significance of keeping the salty medulla, it's helping to, um, first off, either uh, concentrate our urine. So in the event that we that we're sweating a lot, we're losing a lot of water, we're losing a lot of salt. Uh, salt, for instance, if you're you know stranded in the desert, well, we want to retain that water. And so what we're what the result is going to be is we're going to produce a small amount of concentrated urine because because we're trying to retain all of that water. Okay, so. The salt is being pumped out. We're creating this really salty medulla. And uh, one of the hormones that's going to be released, I talked about um, antidiuretic hormone. And so what that does is it inserts aquaporins over here within the collecting duct at these principal cells. And so by inserting this channel here, it allows water to flow. But the rule of thumb here is wherever salt is, that's where water, uh, water will follow. And so this is why we're creating this really salty medulla because in the event that we are losing the water, losing all that salt, it has to be replenished. And so by creating the salty medulla, we get these aquaporins and then water can flow here and get into this interstitial fluid and then it can then uh, get back into the blood. Okay, so we talked about the countercurrent multiplier here. The next thing we need to discuss is the countercurrent exchanger. So I've talked about creating this really salty medulla. Well, how do we keep this medulla really, really salty? We have to use a countercurrent exchanger. And so the countercurrent exchanger is what's known as the vasa recta. So the vasa recta, it helps to preserve this salty medulla. And it does this because Coming here from, so this is the afferent arterial and this is the efferent arterial that comes down this way. Well, what will happen is water coming from here, water is going to leave. So it's the same, same thing here where the, for the descending limb, water is leaving. But it's different in that the salt is going to get back in here. So as water leaves, salt goes back in within the vas vasa recta. So then once you get to the venous system, right, because we're going back uh, through the vein, from there, instead of water leaving, water is going to go back in. So let me do this here in blue. 
So water is going to go back in, and then uh, salt is what's going to leave. So the osmolality here within the vasa recta, it pretty much stays around the same. Uh, from where it comes in, the osmolality, it's pretty much the same whenever it's coming down, and then also uh, when it leaves. Compared to, so also pay attention to here at the top, right? So this is within the cortex, the osmolality. So whenever there's a high osmolality, let me write that down here. Whenever there is a high osmolality, that means that it's more salty in this particular case, in this specific situation. Okay, so now that we understand the countercurrent multiplier and exchanger, the next thing we need to talk about is the juxtaglomerular complex. Some of the different components here for the juxtaglomerular complex include these cells in blue. So these cells in blue are known as the macula densa cells. So these macula densa cells, they are found here on the ascending limb from the loop of Henle. So these macula densa cells, they contain something which is known as chemoreceptors. And these chemoreceptors, what they can detect is our changes. So they'll detect, let's write this over here. They'll detect changes in the salt concentration. So let me, so they detect changes in the salt concentration. So you have the macula densa cells, and then you also have these, this component here in purple. So the component here in purple, these, the, this particular component, this is what's known as the granular cells. So you have the granular cells here in purple, and then the part here in red, that is just, so I'm going to put the smooth muscle. The smooth muscle here that's controlling the diameter for the afferent arterial. Okay, so now let's uh, put this um, into context because what we're going to discuss is uh, some of the different hormones. So we're going to talk about aldosterone and then we're also going to discuss ADH. So what is an event in which we're going to get the secretion of aldosterone as well as ADH. So for instance, whenever you're sweating a lot, okay, so you're sweating a lot, you're losing, you're, you're losing salt and you're also losing water. And so as a result, there's a decrease in the blood pressure. So how do the kidneys here help to uh, regulate that, to increase our blood pressure? So we've already identified uh, some of the different components here. Well, one thing that has to happen is this smooth muscle, it needs to relax. It needs to, we need the afferent arterial to dilate. So the smooth muscle needs to relax and then the afferent arterial, so afferent arterial needs to dilate. So the reason that it needs to, the afferent arterial um, needs to dilate is because we're trying to increase the glomerular filtration rate. So here, these macula densa cells, we're de it's detecting these changes in salt. And so what will happen is by these decreasing levels in salt that's here within the blood, we're gonna inhibit the release of a couple different components. So one of them is adenosine and the other is ATP. So by inhibiting the release of both of these things, they don't bind to their receptors here on the granular cells. And because they're not binding here to the, to the granular cells, there's a decrease in the calcium here. So there's a decrease in the calcium within the smooth muscle cells. So because there's a decrease in the calcium, the, the smooth muscle it'll relax and then the afferent arterial is going to dilate. And so this is just uh, one effect here for the macula densa cells. So then what happens with the granular cells? So by 
ATP not binding to its uh, binding to the granular cell, what this results is the secretion of something which is known as renin. So um, renin is the first the first player that's going to result in the secretion of aldosterone. And we use something which is known as the RAS system. So it's the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So the release of renin by the granular cells, so I'm going to erase this. So I'll put this over here. So you have the RAS system. So the release of renin, once it gets released, it travels to it travels to the liver. And once it gets to the liver, there is something which is known as angiotensinogen. So renin converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. So angiotensin 1, that's what's circulating within the blood. So then once angiotensin 1 gets to gets to the lungs, the lungs contains an enzyme which is known as ACE. So it's known as angiotensin converting enzyme. From there, it gets converted into, let's see how it would go this way. It can, gets converted into angiotensin 2. And so once it gets converted to angiotensin 2, it'll then reach the adrenal cortex. So it reaches the adrenal cortex and it's going to um, activate, so it's going to stimulate the release of aldosterone. And the particular region where angiotensin 2 is going to bind within the adrenal cortex, it's known as the zona glomerulosa. So now we have aldosterone that's uh, secreted into the blood, and then what's its target? So aldosterone, its target is within the collecting duct. So the collecting duct is what I have over here. So this is the collecting duct, and then this particular cell in green, this cell in green is what's known as, this is what's known as a principal cell. So what will happen, once aldosterone gets into the principal cell, it will bind to its receptor. Once it binds to its receptor, from there it stimulates the synthesis of something which is known as epithelial sodium channel. So by synthesizing epithelial so sodium channel, it gets translocated to the apical surface here. We'll do this here at the top. It gets translocated to the apical surface of the principal cell. So that's what's going to come over here. And so as a result, once the sodium that's uh, traveling here through this collecting duct, it'll get reabsorbed. So it'll go through this, uh, the principal cell and then get into the interstitial fluid, increase the um, salt concentration <coughs> uh, here within the blood. Okay, so then the next hormone that we need to talk about is something which is known as ADH. So within, let's see, if we're, I'll draw this over here. So we'll talk about ADH. So within the hypothalamus, there are neurons. And these neurons, this is where they synthesize ADH. So ADH will get synthesized here. It'll, tra it'll uh, get transported along the axon and then reach the axon terminal. And so this axon terminal this is where the ADH is going to be stored. And so within the hypothalamus, this is where we have the osmoreceptors. So these osmoreceptors, they detect changes in osmo osmolality. And so remember, once again, in the event where we're losing a lot of salt, we're losing a lot of water, so osmolality is going to increase. And so as a result, we're going to, we want to increase the amount of water. We want to reabsorb the water and get it back into the blood.
And so once we stimulate these receptors, it'll signa signal an impulse here down, the, uh, down this axon, and then from there the ADHs will get released. So ADH, so remember ADH, it's gonna be found here within the posterior pituitary gland. Pituitary gland. So once it's released here by the posterior uh, pituitary gland, from there it goes into the blood, and then it'll eventually get to, once again, our principal cell. So to the principal cell. And so remember, once again, ADH, this is a peptide hormone. So once ADH binds to its receptor here, we'll then stimulate protein kinase A, so you'll increase cyclic AMP, uh, increase, uh, activate protein kinase A, and then what it does, it adds a phosphate group to these aquaporins. So these aquaporins, they are found here. So they'll add a phosphate group to these aquaporins, and then they'll get translocated here to the apical surface. So we'll, we'll draw that over here. So these aquaporins, they'll get inserted over here. And so as a result, whenever water is flowing down, because typically uh, down the collecting duct, it's impermeable to water, unless, unless we have ADH. So when ADH is present, then we're gonna get that water that's flowing here, and then it'll then get into the interstitial fluid. So then we'll increase the amount of water. And so as a result, we'll increase the, the blood pressure uh, due to utilizing ADH as well as aldosterone. That's going to do it for this lecture.